Hi guys, welcome back to the FF Salon at Money 2020. My name is Emily Redding. And I'm James Prairestubbs. Thank you so much for joining us today, James. And we also have the marvellous Jose with us. I know you guys have already met. What are we thinking about today? What are we doing? We're going to do a little tidy up, just make it, make it a little bit better. A little bit neater? Yeah, exactly. Okay, nothing too drastic? Nothing too drastic. Okay, we're just not going to have a grade one all over. We're no. not doing that today? No. Okay. All right, cool. Well, thank you so much for joining me. How are you doing, first of all? How have you found the first day of Money 2020? Oh, it's huge, isn't it? Yeah. It's a little bit <laughs> overwhelming. <laughs> yes. And um, I'm not in payments, so I feel a little bit, you know, <laughs> at the side. But it's amazing. It's yeah. just great see everyone here yeah absolutely and so do, tell me what you do do so you're not in payments what do you do James what's your job title yes. what have you been up to so the job title is really boring it's chief client officer okay and um, but what we do is kind of interesting so what we do is do you know when everyone makes decisions and you know, when you're sitting in the economics class every economics class I ever sat in started off with man is rational maybe now they say humans are rational but at the time, it was man There's is rational. There's something echoing mine as well, yes. And they would start off with that assumption that we're all a bit like Mr. Spock. Mm -hmm. You know, we're very logical, we make decisions. And actually, when you look at everybody, we're all very emotional. So the decisions we make are based on our personality. And we help banks understand that so that they can serve their clients better. So, you know, Vanguard, for instance, always says, if you invest in Vanguard funds, you'll do really well. Very, very true. And if you look at the Vanguard funds, they do really, really well. If you look at the Vanguard investors, they do less well. Right. Because they're humans. So, you know, they buy when it's high, they sell when it's low. Um, yeah, so that's what we do. We help people get over that. And what would you say, in your experience, is what's the biggest driver or the innate need that your customers have to engage with you? What's, what's that motivation? I what think, do you do really well? I think what we, a couple of things now. So it started off, we're very boring, we're very regulatory driven. You have to understand people's risk. Yes. So suitability, you have to understand how much risk does a given individual want to take. But now we're doing much more fun stuff. So we're doing things like, you know, if you're interested in sustainability, what are you interested in? Yeah. Um, how do I make you feel as emotionally comfortable as possible with your portfolio? Now the reason why I want to do that is I want you to stay invested. If you stay invested for 20 years, it's going to be great. You know, good things are going to happen. Yeah. If you do what I did, which is I used to be that typical finance guy, I spent 25 years in finance, super high confidence, very high confidence, super misplaced, <laughs> very high risk tolerance, and I would just do stuff all the time. And usually they were really stupid things, but okay. I was really good at telling myself a story like why I should be doing this. And my best portfolio was one I didn't even realize I had. So when I was like 21, my first job was Unilever. They put me in a pension portfolio. I completely forgot about it. Gosh. And it's been my highest performing portfolio by buckets, right? Wow. Yeah. So that's what we try and do is to sort of say, how can we help people make better decisions? Mm -hmm. And if we do that, we help the clients grow assets, retain assets, have happy clients high client engagement, all of those things. That is fascinating. So you've said you've done some stupid things. I think we'll get into that. We'll try and get into that in a little bit, well, in a bit later. Well, we, it's a long list. <laughs> we can go through every single stupid thing I've done since 21. Anyway, That's yeah. brilliant. Yes. How long have we got, Jose? We've got some time? We've got some time. Okay. Um, tell me about your background. What led you to Oxford Risk? So you've been in finance for 25 years. So yes. I mean, you really know your stuff. You're an expert in industry. It seems like you've had a very varied career. Tell me what got you here, some of those stupid things you did. Okay, so the main reason I got into finance is I used to be a consultant before. Okay. And I worked for a private equity firm. And this is, okay, I told you it's going to be stupid, so just brace okay. yourself. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready for this. So what okay. I realize is if you're a consultant, they send you to these small towns. And uh, then you, you know, you live in a motel and you kind of live there for like four, four nights of the week. Yeah. So I thought to myself, I'm going to get a job with a bank because they're based in big cities which is just really embarrassing, but you know, and, and so I did. It's also logical though. Yeah, <laughs> it is kind of logical. And I also thought banks were gonna be super analytic, right? Because they had mm. all this data. Yes. And I always liked analytic things. I've always okay. loved that. Yeah, you know, you've since, been a numbers guy. Since childhood. And then I worked in wealth management. And what I realized is that 
actually they're not using the data they have because it's really hard to get. And it's all done on Joe spoke to Marianne, Marianne told Joe that this one client really liked this. And then we all ran after the ball like, you know, like little kids playing football. So that was kind of for me one part. And then the other thing I, I kind of realized in the 25 years is we would design these great products. Super, super mm. rational, you know, portfolio maximizing risk return. And we would have all these very important people who would spend a lot of time sort of really sort of predicting the future mm. or trying to. Yes. Um, really impressive people, like, you know, super clever. And the clients just didn't care. The wow. clients wanted somebody they trusted. They wanted to feel comfortable. They wanted to feel like they could trust you as an institution. You weren't going to go bankrupt. And that emotional side, we just couldn't deal with it, right? We'd say things like, oh, the clients are crazy, or, you know, we haven't communicated it well enough. Maybe if we give them more sort of manuals and more books, they'll finally understand yes, the principles. Yes, they need more numbers. They need yes. more numbers. Surely. I know, exactly. <laughs> And the clients would be like, no, no, no we're fine. And we actually, we're person. very smart, you know. Um, we just want something which we can feel comfortable, we understand, and we're happy to stick with. That's fascinating. Have you found it shift from when you first started out and there was very much that need? Is it, are people still asking for that? Or have they, is it kind of come full circle? So I think the What's need the is still like? there. I think the change which has happened, so you know, you, you may know thinking fast and slow, all, the, all those economists who won all those Nobel Prizes. Yes. And it took a long time for that thinking to percolate its way into banks, but it has. So now you know, you'll see banks like I think Barclays had the first behavioral finance team. Mm -hmm. In Australia, they have behavioral finance teams. And they're really trying to put the human back into the banking. And that's a trend which we're seeing more and more. And is there something that you would say, looking back across your career, was there a pivotal point or a big moment that you were really proud of? Whether that was one of the more stupid or silly things that you've alluded to that you've then, you then overcame, or hindsight's a wonderful thing, isn't it? Is there yeah. something that you thought, okay, maybe that right. wasn't the right path, but my God, that was a good decision. So I'll give you a good one, and then I'll yes. give you a bad one. Great, okay, I so love then the you balance. can choose which ones you want. Okay. So the good one was we, when I was in um, a large Swiss wealth manager, we launched the first sort of impact fund. And it was a big impact fund, it was called the Oncology Fund, and it was to help people uh, you know, fund really cutting edge cancer treatments. Yeah. So there's the idea that there's this kind of gap between what the academics are doing and then what is commercially viable and the drug companies and startups pick up on. So this fund was designed to close that gap. Sure. And so we raised a billion, so at the Incredible. time, you know, that was like, eight, 10 years ago, it was the big impact fund. And we were blown away by how successful it was because actually financially it was okay, but there was like hundreds of other venture funds. But when we were talking to clients and we were saying like, we're trying to cure cancer. Yes. Every single client was like, I know somebody who suffered from this. I want to help. I want to invest my money. Wow. So that really made me feel like, okay, well there's something, you know, about this sort of emotional side that we need to tie into. And it was, it was a very genuine thing, right? It wasn't just sort of a marketing thing. It was like people were genuinely touched. All right, that's the good one. That's a great one. I mean, talk about really like force for good. Yes. Getting up every day and changing the world. I mean, you tick that box. Right. Yes. That, at one time. <laughs> um, the bad one was we designed this thing where people had lots of cash. Okay. And uh, we came up with a structured product, which was based off a... Um, it was based on, I think, a Mongolian bank or something like that. It was completely secure. Ooh. And it gave you another 100 basis points of return. And I was like, this thing is amazing. No one bought it. No one bought it. Because they were like, Why? well, they're like, you know, I have cash. Yeah. What you're offering me is incomprehensible. And I get 1% more a year. Why would I ever do that to myself? Okay. So that was the one where I was kind of like, logically and rationally, this should be so successful. Yes. And literally no one bought it. When I say no one bought it, I'm not exaggerating. No it, there one was zero. bought it. I mean, you know, maybe my best friend, but like, <laughs> that was pretty much it. So those kinds of things really make you feel like, and now at Oxford Risk, what I feel really proud of is when we actually help investors um, get those better returns. There are a lot of investors who can't afford a financial advisor. Mm -hmm. And for them, you know, how do you understand that person? How do you tailor things to them? I agree. No, that's fantastic. I think we're ready. Good. For the big, big swivel. Oh, yeah. Excellent. Wow.
Da, 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 Amazing. Da. Thank you. I need my glasses. That's right. I can't, Super I can't smart. see anything. Right, let's sorry. put your glasses back on. I know. I'm sorry. I say. Thank you. It looks amazing. I think. Wow. Good. Cool. Better. Perfect. Sensational. Thank you. Well, much James, better. Thank you so much for joining. It was a real thank pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank and you. lovely to meet you. And thank you, Jose.